one. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a group of people who are frequently overlooked when we talk about our workforce. People with special needs, including mobility or intellectual challenges, and those who are medically involved or have chronic health diagnoses are one of the most often ignored sources of talent. Often, these people want to work and are capable of performing the essential functions of a job, but they are simply overlooked by employers who are in need of talent. By law, every child is entitled to a free and appropriate education, and special ed programs are available at many of Hawaii's public schools. But what happens to a student with special needs once they graduate from high school or age out of special ed programs? And what about their families? How do parents, siblings, and the rest of the ohana ensure that a child with special needs continues to receive training and other necessary services when public education is no longer an option? Today's guest has a great deal of information to share on this topic. She's the mother of two children with special needs, and she's going to tell us about the challenges and the blessings of raising kids who have special needs. We want you to join in the conversation, too. Please call us at area code 415-871-2474 or tweet at ThinkTechHI. And now, please join me in welcoming Talitha Manigo. Hi, Talitha. Hello, how are you today? I'm fine. How are your kids? Wonderful. Good. Wonderful. Now, you've got three. Yes. Two of them have special needs. That is correct. And it's the two older ones. They're 20 and 18. Yes. And then your 14-year-old is um, uh, does not have special needs. At one point he did. Okay. He had a developmental delay uh -huh. in his speech, mm -hmm. and he went to Tripler for two and a half years because we are a military family, mm -hmm. and that got corrected over that period of time, and mm -hmm. now he's a straight-A student. Fantastic. Yes. Um, first, can you tell us a little bit about the process that enabled the medical professionals and others to diagnose your other two children? Sure, I can. As um, far as my daughter, I noticed that something was different in her development at an early age. She mm -hmm. wasn't catching up uh, the essentials, just uh, communication style and things of that, and that words, verbiage. So I had her diagnosed at a very young age, probably around about four and a half, five. Mm -hmm. And they said that she wasn't developing as she should be. Uh, as time went on, she had more diagnosis, and she was eventually diagnosed as being bipolar disorder. Uh, ADHD and uh, oppositional defined disorder and learning disorder. Mm -hmm. So it was a gamut of a variety of things. Uh, as far as my son is concerned, he's uh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. That's my 18 year old. Mm -hmm. And I think what really helped me was the fact of uh, Ahana coming to Hawaii, mm -hmm. simply put, to be honest with you, and being stabilized since I uh, was divorced from my spouse. It allowed me the fortitude of getting the services that the island had to provide, which I think was very helpful mm -hmm. in coming here. Uh, without that, I don't think I would be able to have done as much as I did. And then by the state of Hawaii just recognizing the fact that I needed to provide uh, external care to my children, internal and external, mm -hmm. for long durations of time, which is really a 24-hour care to provide oh. for them. Uh -huh. So it was recognized in the family court, and it was also recognized with the Child Enforcement Agency and I was deemed that I didn't have to work in order to take care of them, mm -hmm. which I know many people don't have that advantage of doing, mm -hmm. but I was really blessed to have that given to me as a single parent. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to um, understand the care that was required of my children more so, mm -hmm. and the dynamics and go to more medical appointments and advocate for them and understand what the process was for the healing of them to get them up to speed and where they need to be in life. Mm -hmm. So that was really beneficial to me, and I appreciate that. So you became, well, I mean, every mother is a 24-hour mother, but yes. you had the responsibility for all of the hands-on mothering um, and all of that as, as all three of your children were growing yes, up. Yes, because the average parent, like you said, they have to work, mm -hmm. and I was given that blessing of not having to work in that format of a nine to five. Mm -hmm. So when it was recognized, um, the judge basically said, I work when it's practical, understanding that the dynamics of my children were priority. Mm -hmm. And I stressed to him the importance of uh, 
a lot of services are not 24-hour care. Right. So that's where I came in, and I was able to fill a lot of those positions and, you know, be hands-on as a mom and give them the extra care that they need and also the extra attention. Mm -hmm. Because when you have special needs children, it's not just a one-day thing. Right. You know, and it taught me a lot as a mother as well, patience, for example, mm -hmm. and able to juggle and balance the needs of having one child that was no longer special needs mm -hmm. versus the other two that were. Hmm. So I had to learn, you know, a lot of patience, uh, dedication. I went through a lot of worry and frustration. I think all mothers do, you know, when a child was not as they had the expectation of them being, mm -hmm. you know, just a regular kid like everybody else. So you got to try to family balance within yourself. You know, how do you fix the problem? Mm -hmm. How do you advocate for that child? Mm -hmm. How do you wind up showing, you know, what would be best for that child? And so you're talking with the psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, and all those parties that help with the participation of the child mm -hmm. to get the child where they need to go. Mm -hmm. So it really gave me, you know, a blessing to me uh, in disguise, which I didn't recognize at the time, to be there with them, mm -hmm. to understand the whole gamut of what was going on with them, mm -hmm. you know. Now, you mentioned that you uh, had divorced. Yes. And uh, other family members, extended family, provided support to you. Did they move to Hawaii to be with you? I didn't have that. So that's why I said it was a blessing for me to have not be able to work. Oh, gotcha. I am, okay. uh, came here way of a military service member being married. We got divorced here. And I decided to stay in actuality because of the ohana, mm -hmm. because of the services that were given to me and the fact that it was recognized, you know, as I said before, with the court system. And I took that and I ran with it, you know, and I looked at it as a true blessing because I didn't have support avenues of my mm -hmm. mother and extended family to come here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this, I was the beginning and the middle of the whole story. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. Now, did your did your kids receive services via public education, the public schools, or, or yes, was some of it did. military? Uh, they received services, educational component through the public schools, but they also received, like, um, additional services regarding uh, medical treatment and things like that. So mm -hmm. some were in-house through the military aspect and some were also on uh, in Hawaii itself, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was um, very good to me because, you know, at points in times, you know, if the military couldn't provide it or it was taking too long to get appointments or assessing the staff that I needed as far as the medical component, then I could go into the Hawaii, you know, the uh, Hawaii side, you know, mm -hmm. the local side and mm -hmm. uh, endure that endeavor of getting the services so I can have continuum of care without having a break in services needed for that health of my child. Right. So that right. was very beneficial to me. Now, I've got to ask you a question. Um, I have a special needs sibling, which I was mentioning to you before we went yes. on the air. Uh, he's grown now uh, in terms of age and just being a grown man sort of chronologically, but intellectually, he's not. He's an yes. infant in many ways. How do you, but two of your children are adult by law now. Yes. How do you provide what is reasonable for an adult, but still acknowledging that there are areas of these children that may require the type of care that you would give to a younger child? Yes, and that was very hard for me and challenging because they realize something is different with them, mm -hmm. you know, and just uh, growing up in the development of a child. They're in a special needs classroom, so they're not with the regular component of every other child. Uh, they realize the development, the hormonal balance within themselves and that. So it was challenging for me because it's like sometimes you can be overbearing and you try to safeguard them from everything that's external so they won't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And then other times you try to pull back, you know, and let them go on their own, but you're scared they're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more of an internal network within yourself. When they acknowledge to you, I got this, you set them up for success, not failure, and you give them the tools that they need to let them know they can achieve it. Mm -hmm. And then you praise them for the things that they do, if in this is, even if it's in an incomplete task. Mm -hmm. So that to me was very beneficial to let go a little bit and, you know, have that fear factor of, like I said, I'm not them getting hurt, but you set them up with the acknowledgement and the blessings and let them know that they can do it and you advocate for them every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So they will have challenges within their own right and you have to give them that. 
because that makes them reassess, you know, well, maybe I'm not ready for this right now, or maybe I need a little bit more care in this area right now, mm -hmm. you know. And then you just pull back, and then you jump back in when necessary. Mm -hmm. So I have to really say, you know, I think if I didn't have all that time with my children, they wouldn't be so much um, attuned to where they're at in life right now mm -hmm. in general. I think they have been very successful in their own right. But like I said, for me, it was a checks and balance of knowing what I can do as a mother, what my limitations were, mm -hmm. and what my um, attributes were. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes you can love a little too much, and you can hold them back from where they need to be. My daughter right now, um, she went to culinary school, and she also works at the zoo as a cook. My son, he's graduating from high school this year, uh -huh. you know, and he wants to go to college as well to be a football player. So I'm a very big advocate of cheering my children on to let them know they can be a great success within their own rights. Mm -hmm. And I don't let their disabilities be a hindrance to them mm -hmm. to cripple them. Mm -hmm. They are aware of them, but they also take into consideration how can they balance it. I may not be good in this area, but I could be more assertive in this area right. and still overcome. Right. Now, both of your children have ADHD to some degree. Yes. How do you differentiate between this is their condition kicking in, uh, mm -hmm. making it difficult for them to focus or pay attention or these kinds of things, and just rebellious teenager being a pain because they want to see how far they can push mom? I think that's a trial by trial basis because I think it depends on the task, to be honest with you. Okay. As far as like an educational task, homework assignment, for example, if you see them struggling, can't concentrate, need more breaks, things like that, then you know it's more of an educational component, medication maybe need to be restructured, mm -hmm. or more breaking down of information and data so they can achieve whatever the uh, standard is. Mm -hmm. And I think on the other end, I think it's just peer pressure too, you know, just growing up and being an adolescent. So with that, to me, mostly you got to have patience mm -hmm. and you got to step back before you make a judgment. Right. And I think that's the most important thing. And then you can see it with better eyes per se, you mm -hmm. know, just take a two minute or two second break or whatever, reassess the situation and see what it really is instead of you just jumping in for what you think it is. Yeah. And that's, I think, is the biggest thing for me. Well, that's great. So you've got two that finished high school, one that's finished a professional program. Yes. Um, we're going to go to break in just a second here, but when we come back, I want to talk about your two older kids, mm -hmm. and I want to talk specifically about their job prep and the kinds of accommodations they may need at the workforce Understood. to be able to um, do a good job as an employee with special needs. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. No problem. So we will be back in just a minute. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. You want to talk about some socially sensitive issues relevant to women? Listen to these guys. Well, I think it's important in Judaism that we don't take the Bible literally. We take it seriously. Okay. I agree. And the, really the key to understanding Christianity is compassion. If you're compassionate towards other people, you are living a Christian life. And that relates also to dealing with women and men and women issues as well. Mm. Are women and men equal? They're equal. Who's Why better? Be Who's better? <laughs> Depends Tune on in. what. Tune in. Hello, this is Martin Despang. Please join me on my new show, Humane Architecture, like the one in the back that you see by architect David Rockwood. The show is going to be on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu. See you then. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and I'm speaking with Talitha Manigo about the gifts and challenges of raising children with special needs. Join in with your questions or comments. Call us at area code 415-871-2474 or tweet us at ThinkTechHI. Now, Talitha, before we went on break, you mentioned that your two older children had already completed high school and that your daughter was employed at the zoo as a cook yes. and, um, and is doing very well in that job. What kinds of accommodations in particular did your children need in order to perform the essential functions of a job? And especially your daughter, was it difficult for her to find an employer that was willing to make those accommodations? 
I think it is sometimes because of the fact you want to have a good mesh. Right. Like I said, you want to set the child up for success, not failure. So I think the most thing you should do is be upfront about what the needs of the child is and talk to the employer and see if that employer can make those accommodations mm -hmm. um, as far as my daughter is concerned. You know, so you have to start them off easy, you know, uh, when it comes to the job component and things of that nature. Just be honest and say this is the needs of the child, you know, if the child need frequent breaks or anything like that, if it need more oversight, just to get down the basics, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Uh, my daughter, she's more of a um, hands-on type person, mm -hmm. and I realized that through her development. She could learn as she do, okay, versus okay. Uh, being our, um, you know, um, being more articulate with her skills or also analytical thinker. Uh -huh. She's not. So if you have to demonstrate her, because people learn in different ways. Right. Some people learn by reading is something they can comprehend. Some people learn by touch and feel. Some people learn just by hearing. Mm -hmm. So with her, she has to feel it, see it, and it comes recognizable from memory. Uh -huh. And repetition was the thing for her. Uh -huh. So very simple, easy tasks were best for her. And just, uh, to, like I said, the most part for me was just being up front with employers and letting them know I have a special needs child. She is a gift, you know. Can you work with us? Can you give them simple tasks and things like that? And in the end, the child really feels rewarded by that, you know, because it gives them a level of independence. Right. And it lets them know they can achieve. And I think most of the time, any child with special needs just want to feel normal, like everybody else. Right. They don't want to stick out for something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So that's what was beneficial to her. Regarding my son, he's still in school right now, and he's graduating in May. Mm -hmm. I am currently talking to uh, the Rehabilitation and Vocational Services, which is a nonprofit organization funded through the state. Mm -hmm. And they also help with counseling, resume writing, cover letters. They also help with um, technical schools, trade schools, colleges, and things of that nature mm -hmm. to help support the child. And what you do on the intake is they assess the child. The child has a disability. Once they find out the child does have a disability and meet the standards, then they set up a plan. So it's like an IDP, mm -hmm. you know, individualized uh, educational plan. Same concept. And what they do is they assess the child and they find out what better ways the child learns and things like that, what colleges will be best for them mm -hmm. and what accommodations can be made at like the community colleges or the university for that child to go to. So uh, that was very beneficial to me. Mm -hmm. Like I said, once they evolve from high school, there are programs out here in the state of Hawaii. I don't think they really publicize as much as they could be. I had to research and find out what was there to benefit my child. I usually go talk to them one-on-one -on -one versus over the phone. Right. I think you can make a better impression you know, and explain to them and get their focus to say, okay, I'm here, I have a child, and I'm here to advocate for my child. Can you help and assist me, mm -hmm. you know, and see what's the better fit for your child? Because it has to work on both ends. Right. Because you want a successful relationship with anybody that you partner with with these services on the island mm -hmm. for your child to procreate and mm -hmm. become a productive member to society. Right, right. Now, um, your daughter works full-time yes, at the zoo? Yes, she does. Did she, cook, did she work at the... Um, uh, the refreshment stand? Yes. Uh -huh. I want to go get some of her food. <laughs> what, kind, what kind of cooking uh, responsibilities does she have? Oh, she started out cleaning tables because okay. we had to work up to it. She was started out cleaning tables, and then they had her in the room being supervised. So she makes the standard little cheeseburgers and hot dogs there and things like that. And I think that's a really good fit for her because I was taking her around to different culinary schools on the island mm -hmm. and to see what they offer, you know, to talk to the management, see what accommodations they make for special needs children. I think that's really should be your start question. Mm -hmm. You know, um, hi, my name is this, and what do you have? as far as your accommodations and then you can go down there and research and see the atmosphere of the environment see if it's a good mesh mm -hmm. so I mean that thing is it's very valuable to do that mm -hmm. you know because in the end you want like I said again a productive relationship that is going to be safe for that child right uh, attainable for that child and realistic you right. know and measurable tell let's let's talk about the safety aspect yes um, I don't know about you as your kids were growing up but one of the fears that I have mm -hmm for my brother, especially as he reached the age of, of legal majority and as, and as a man um, with all of the uh, reproductive gifts that come with being a man. Mm -hmm. No, I, I have yeah. this ongoing worry that, um, that sexual predation um, may become a problem. He, because he can't say no. He, because he, he doesn't know the word no. I understand. Um, and yet he has all of the 
physiological attributes needed to sire children, but to care for them as a father, he cannot. So it would be a real problem if he was in a situation where he had somehow uh, fathered a child. How do you deal with those issues for yours? Because they're both, they're both legal adults now. Do they that date? Are they in relationships? Yes, they do. Both of them do. I like the fact that my son has a girlfriend mm -hmm. and they're in the same high school mm -hmm. and same grade. Oh. And she is aware of his disability. Um, she's very nice about it, you know, what he don't understand and can't uh, familiarize himself with certain information. She'll explain it to him. I've never seen her look at it as a hindrance, if anything, because he's a very sociable butterfly mm -hmm, by nature. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would not know that unless it was something that was on a piece of paper that was written and things like that or tasks that need to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, she's aware that he's in a special needs class, but uh, like I said, for her, you know, that's not a factor. So I do worry about the fact, you know, making good choices and, and making uh, sensitive things that you do mm -hmm. and not just doing things that you believe make sense. So that's a big difference. Uh, regarding my daughter, I'm a little bit more, um, I would say, more secluded with her. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, uh, you got to have open lines of communication with all your children. Some need it more than others. So with her, I communicate more with her on a level to let her know what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and words that she can understand, you know, and talk to her on a regular basis to let her know, you know, this is what I feel about the situation, you know, and just come more off as a, a caring friend, more mm -hmm. than a mother with everything. You can't be a mother with everything because they're gonna close down on you. Mm -hmm. So with that aspect, I believe just having good lines of communication and uh, like I said before, always setting a child up for the best success possible, putting them in areas where they can achieve and succeed, uh, not allowing them to go places like your son, I mean like your uh, cut uncle, what did you say? Brother. Brother, I'm sorry. Like your brother, not letting him go places that will be not in his best interest, right. I think is a good set setting for you in that uh, way and things of that nature, yeah. you know. Are, they, are both of your older children at home with you? No. My okay. daughter does not reside with me right now. Oh, where does she live? She lives in a group home right now. Ah, uh, because that was going to be my next question. Mm -hmm. At what point uh, do you as a parent say, okay, adults at this age, you should be living more independently on your own, so let me help you find a place? Okay. Did, did you do that or did she drive that? I think me, because mm -hmm. I think it was more challenging um, as time went on and she became an adult. I realized that she needed more care than I could provide. And I realized that I couldn't maintain a balance anymore with trying to help my other special needs son and my son that does not have special needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a challenge for any mother, to be honest with you. When you know enough is enough, that was my question. Mm -hmm. So I didn't turn off the mother factor. I just had to realize that I can be a little bit more hands off due to the age and mm -hmm. due to the fact of allowing other people to come in to supplement where I couldn't. So I can achieve more to better my situation for all my children. Mm -hmm. So she's not there long term, but it's just right now, like I was told, you know, you just gotta set her aside right now, you know, and do you. And I don't think anything's wrong with that if you still keep in communication with that child and still take care of that child mm -hmm. to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's a very hard question. You know, I ask myself that constantly, when is enough is enough? Mm -hmm. When do I start making myself a priority? Because I think as mothers, we put ourselves on the back burner. As soon as that child is birthed, you know, every need, everything we do is for the welfare of that child. But you lose yourself in the process. Mm -hmm. And then I said, once she get 18, once I get her settled, you know, in residential care, and I can make sure she was in a safe environment, a healthy environment where she can prosper, and I don't have to be so hands-on, then I was able to do that, mm -hmm. but not until I felt safe to do that. Right, and your son is, both boys are still with you. Yes. Uh -huh. How do you balance the needs of a, an older child with special needs with the needs of a younger teenager, because your other son is 14, yeah. how do you balance those needs? Because kids with special needs often need more attention. Yes, they do. But yet, at the young teenage years, that's the time where if a kid is going to start going on an incorrect path, mm -hmm. that's when they're going to start. And worse for you, they're both boys. Well, for me, I, like I said before, um, I had to learn mm -hmm. the balance. And what I also realized that there's nothing wrong with therapy. I was in therapy myself to understand 
you know, my children and what their needs were because at one point I was like, I felt like a failure. You know, like what's going wrong? Why is this happening to me? I think all mothers have that, you know. And then my younger son, I put him in therapy uh, because of the fact that he didn't understand, you know, exactly what was going on with the situation of the older children. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when it's coming from a parent to a child, they don't really hear you. But right. if you have another party that's talking to them and making them relatable, you know, to what's going on, I think that's uh, perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you need additional services, and right. I don't have no problem reaching out for them if it's for the betterment of my family in order to have a successful end. Mm -hmm. So that's what mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, I know that in my family's experience growing up, uh, I was, I'm the oldest, and I'm 17 years older than the youngest, who is my brother with special needs. And I think the three of us, the three older kids, who at the time were 17, 16, and 12, uh, and then we had this baby, um, I think we were all looking at being the the fun older brothers and sisters mm -hmm. who drag the young kid along yeah. and take him to the movies and take him to the zoo and take him to the places. And it ended up we couldn't do those things. Yes. So there's a grieving process, even for the kids, and even if they don't acknowledge it, I think it's like, Oh man, I thought I was gonna be cool. I got that. You know, uh, and I, that I, kind I got of thing. I didn't get I got the actual comment. Uh, you spend more time on her than you are on me. Uh -huh. You know, and I had to take a step back and realize that was the truth. So that's why I had services come in uh -huh. along the way. I had therapeutic foster care for my daughter at points in times. Mm -hmm. I had a um, therapeutic uh, foster care uh, assistant come in the house through uh, the Department of Human Services and also through uh, the state of Hawaii mm -hmm. um, health services. Okay. So they came in as a counselor, as a therapist, yeah. and they would take her places and stuff like that for therapeutic care, uh -huh. you know, and take her on outings and things like that. So that gave me the possibility of taking the boys out to other outings. Oh, that's great. I'm yeah. so glad you got the help you need because I know there's a lot of families out there that struggle. Yes. Um, our time is up. So okay. we're, gonna, <laughs> we're going to adjourn for the moment. All right. But, uh, you know, my thanks to Talitha Manigo, and especially my thanks to all of those who work with families that have special need kids. You may not realize it, but you're doing a ministry, folks, and the families really appreciate it, even if they, they're not in a position to tell you so. I'll see you in two weeks. I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, and thank you for joining us on Working Together at ThinkTech Hawaii. Bye-bye. <laughs>